What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Make Money and Have Fun show. This has been such an amazing month. So many cool things have gone down, have happened this month. I've been interviewing authors every single day this month. And it's been so cool because each author is really coming from a different place. They're really, some people are writing business books. Some people are writing self-help books, nonfiction, fiction books. Today, we're talking about a fantasy book, which is going to be really really cool so let's get into it my motto in life is make money and have fun i'm on a mission to show everyone how to make money yeah, and have fun i'm all about making money and having fun You know what that music means. It's time to get started. So here's the deal. I always bring people on here and I never know like if the people are going to be camera shy, if they're going to run away, they're going to say that they're going to be here and then they're not actually here. So, you know, it's always a toss up with my my different guests that I bring on. But today I'm super excited to be bringing on my good friend, Christopher Russell. What's up, Chris? Hey, Fred. Thanks for having me. And I'm not camera shy and I'm going to ramble and talk your ear off. Because yes. I just keep going. It keeps spilling out. I, I like you. I, I like people just like that. So that's awesome, man. Dude, what's going on? Tell us about yourself. Uh, not much. My name is Christopher Russell. I am the author. You can actually see the poster board here, but also the awesome paperbacks from Morgan James Publishing of Divinity's Twilight Rebirth. This is my first fantasy novel in the Divinity's Twilight series. And it is a series that deals with forgotten gods, long lost promises, heroes and villains on both sides, great wars, um, great social upheavals, revolutions. There's a lot of stuff going on in this series. Um, it was originally intended to be a trilogy, but my plotting has since expanded to be a 10 book series. It is gonna be epic. Um, I hope that it's going to go really far, that maybe there'll even be an adaptation of it because yeah. there's, there's a lot of good stuff to unpackage in this series. And my background for this comes from, I was originally mechanical and aerospace engineering and everybody's going, what? Why is some little stick in the mud that's supposed to be in a back room crunching numbers on a calculator writing fantasy novels? Well, I grew up loving fantasy. Um, the first ones I cut my teeth on were the Redwall series by Brian Jocks. That's a bunch of uh, anthropomorphic animals and they go on these great adventures and quests uh, as they fight off evil vermin like uh, stoats and rats and ferrets and um, other what are considered unclean creatures. And, and that was tons of fun. I went to Lord of the Rings. I did Star Wars. Now, Star Wars is where um, I started to bridge the gap from fantasy to sci-fi, which is what Divinity's Twilight is. There are airships and a bunch of cool technology in this world. And Star Wars gave that to me. I was like, wow, they have these incredible spaceships. They have droid technology and clone technology and all this fun stuff. And I thought to myself, well, that, that, that's originally how I got into being an engineer. And then I backtracked that um, I had the creative side. I went and got the technical expertise. And then when I got out of my undergrad, I thought to myself, well, you've always wanted to write a book and you've read all these cool fantasy series. Why don't we make a book that bridges the gap between science um, and magic and write a cool epic with lots of characters, lots of cool morals and themes and things that kids are kids and adults are really going to sink their teeth into. I'd say this is more of an adult fantasy, yeah. but the, the protagonists are 20 something. So there's a lot for young adults and teens with the way that they overcome their problems, they deal with their flaws, their limitations, uh, lots of depression and cowardice and other things that everyone deals with. That's amazing. I, mm -hmm. I thought this was so cool. I remember when we did the, the little intro before the start of the month, I thought that this was such a cool book. I um, I wrote two books. So my first book was just a, a self-help book, right? Simple, basic kind of book. But my second book was actually a collection of blog posts that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And at one point I, I dipped my toe in the water of writing fiction. And I was like, you know, I think I want to like create my own mythology. I'm, I've been a big geek of, of uh, Greek mythology pretty much my whole life. It, I just, I geek out over that. It's, it's super fun. It's super cool. And I'm like, you know what, let me try something. And, and, you know, I, it, it just, you know, sunk. I was like, ah, gave up on the idea super quick. But to see that you actually put together like this this feature length novel in a sense with with a, a very story driven arc to it, as well as this kind of fantasy sci fi and mythology vibe to it is really, really cool. What was that that process like 
you know, getting that all from, from your head into an actual book? Uh, well, first off, I'd say go back and pick up the, the fiction book that you're working on, because the only person that can write that great fiction book is you, that you're the only one with those ideas, the only one that can bring that to fruition, because nobody is going to write the exact same story that you're going to write. Of course, you already know that being an author. But um, my mythology, um, I so there is a creator. Um, it so I take elements of Christianity and I would say um, Hinduism in a way, as well as the Greek pantheon. So there's a little bit of that. Uh, there is a one supreme creator that uh, came into existence, made everything, but he was having trouble managing things. So he split himself into seven different entities, which is where you get the Hinduism aspect. One supreme God that is composed of different parts split himself into seven different pieces in order to better manage each of the seven races in existence. Uh, however, that sort of failed because he's in a constant struggle with his antithesis, the void, the, the anti of creation that wants to return everything to nothingness. And so the, the void's uh, way to go about this is to prove to the creator that existence is meaningless, that his creations are inherently evil, that they will constantly try to destroy each other, that they are going to bring an, every, an end to everything he loves and cares about. So there is a, um, a deific struggle, a divine struggle going on behind Divinity's Twilight, even while the characters are dealing with their mundane daily affairs, um, the, a war between the three Terran nations, um, which are essentially humans in this world. There are six other races. Um, they're, they're, who have their own problems. Um, the Sylph and the Hughes, uh, Sylph, very powerful magic users, red skin. Uh, Hughes um, are extremely good with technology, very curious, very wise. Um, and they have been feuding with the Sylph over a major deposit of Illyrium. So that brings in your resources disputes and parts of economics and things like that uh, for centuries. So th there's a lot going on in this world in addition to the wow. uh, deific struggle. Wow. I can see how this mm -hmm. turns into a, a 10 series book. I, I'm, I mean, I'm even thinking like almost like a video game, like class based kind of idea mm -hmm. behind it. There, there's there's so much to this. It's it's such an interesting just kind of, I guess, world or, or like lexicon that you kind of created in there. What I guess what kind of was was the spark behind this book where you were like, you know what, I got this, uh, this idea, this story, I want to write it, I want to make it. W was there like any particular moment that stands out to you that, that kind of caused that? Uh, well, I'd always wanted to write a book and mm -hmm. I started, um, my first attempt at writing fiction was for my high school honors project. And I actually, I actually sidelined that, but what it was, was a historical fiction called First Legion. And the idea was, what if Julius Caesar wasn't assassinated? What if he found out about the plot, he had Brutus and the rest of the senators put to death, cleared the Senate, brought in a new bunch of people, and essentially set himself up as de facto emperor early. So um, I gave the Brutii faction, which is Brutus's family, more power than they actually had, put them in control of Greece, um, part of Turkey, the extents of the Roman Empire at the time. Well, they secede from the Roman Empire, and Marcus Aurelius, the um, the head character who's named after an emperor that would come later on, is sent out to as part of the subjugation force to bring that part of the empire back into the fold. And so, did historical fiction, got about 150 pages into that. It was going great. Uh, teachers liked it, worked for the honors project, but there was something missing. And what was missing was that... I was able to create the characters. I was able to create the plot, the idea, the what if scenario of Julius Caesar surviving his assassination, but everything else about the world, I had to maintain what already existed, what is, was strictly um, available to me. So the weapons, the armor, the policies, the customs, the uh, dress, the religion, everything. So I was, I was, of what is realistic, what is in the real world, because it's historical fiction. You're going to drive away your audience if you don't. So I went, well, I want to write fantasy then. I want to write fantasy sci-fi and take all of the stuff in the real world and recombine it and remerge it the way that I want to do it. And that went on the back burner for a number of years. I went off to college, did my undergrad in mechanical and aerospace engineering, and 
I, I still wanted to write during that time, but when you come back at a seven or eight o'clock at night after you've gone to class, done your homework on grounds, maybe done some exercise or whatever, and you're just burnt out and tired and want to go to sleep, well, you might just watch a video or play a game or something for that hour before bed. You don't want to do something that's a little work route like, like writing. Writing requires a habit. It's a lot of fun, but you have to make sure that you have a schedule. You have to make sure that you're going to get down and do the work because at the end of the day, um, like your motto says, make money, have fun. You're trying to make money with it, that you yep. are, this is a product that you want to be good, that you want to put out there so that people will enjoy it. So there is a work aspect. It is a job. Sure. It is one of the best jobs you can possibly have, but it is mm -hmm. still a job. So put it on the back burner. And then eventually I read a series called Shadows of the App by Adrian Tchaikovsky. He is a lesser known author for Tor. Um, he is based out of Britain. He teaches writing courses at one of the universities over there. I'm not going to attempt to guess which one because I'll get it wrong. But um, amazing series. And what he does is he moves magic to the back burner. In, um, in a world where people have abilities based on their insect ancestors. And you have the apt and the inapt in this world. The apt are great with technology, and the inapt could touch a doorknob and not be able to open a door because their mind simply can't comprehend it. And the apt eventually rise up and overthrow the magic-wielding inapt, and that's where the series begins. Um, with a technological revolution. You have the crossbow coming into being, you have a pike and shot, you have um, a bunch of the stuff of the Renaissance coming about and moving into the industrial era. And I thought, wow, this is really cool how each of these technological advancements not only change society, but change warfare, that they change how nations perceive that whether or not they have an advantage over their neighbors. And I said, I wanna do something like that. And I sat down during a thermodynamics lecture um, this is uh, my second year of college, and I drew a map, the original map for Divinity's Twilight, which has since been reproduced by the fantastic Terry Johnson in the book itself. So these are my original Tolkien-esque maps for Southern Lazaria, which is the continent slash world on which Divinity's Twilight takes place. And I'm struggling with my camera here to get this into view. But as you can see, there's a bunch of different nations, a bunch of different geographical features, um, really cool cities like Sarconia up here at the very top, the biggest city in the world. Um, there's fortresses, there's monsters, there's storm fronts, there's a bunch of different cool features. And that was sort of combining my background in um, history and geography that these are, that there need to be geopolitical boundaries and rivers and different natural resources that enabled these nations to arise before you could ever start having a plot. And I continued on, on with that. I wrote for about two months. I got uh, two chapter, two or three chapters done. Everything was going great. And then I hit a wall. And I thought to myself, again, this is work, that I'm doing lots of engineering stuff. I've been staying up a little bit really late because I would write from like nine to midnight. And then I'd be waking up at six the next day Nice. And, and going back to class. And I was thinking, I'm not getting any sleep. I'm losing efficiency. Let's put this on hold. And that's the big thing about writing. You can't put it on hold because again, it is a writing is a good habit. It, it takes what, 80, 90 days to make a good habit. So if you, and it takes 30 days to break it, it's, it's much less time to break a habit. And so you, you get out of it, you, you lose that flow, you lose that efficiency and everything just mm -hmm. grinds to a halt. Yep. And so it took, um, because I finished Divinity's Twilight about four years ago and have been working on its sequels. Um, the next one is finished and with beta readers, and I've been working on a standalone book that's going to take place in the same universe. And I've also participated in a big author anthology called From the Shadows. You can actually download it for free from Amazon or get this wonderful, huge bludgeoning device of a paperback from them as well. But these are all 10,000 word short stories from the villain's Jeez. perspective. And so the one that I wrote in there, Gravitas, has been getting really good reception. And I, I think that people will enjoy it. It's sort of an anti-hero. But um, again, getting off topic, back to Divinity's Twilight. Um, so I took about six or seven years off. And then I read a book called, um, what was it? Resisting Happiness by Matthew Kelly. And the idea behind resisting happiness is that your refusal to say yes at any given point in your life for any decision 
is going to basically take away from your joy, that you are going to miss opportunities that you otherwise would have. And I read the first chapter, I had a come to Jesus moment, and I decided I'm going to write this book. And I went and wrote like 10 to 12 single spaced Word document pages that night. And I finished uh, chapter three or something like that. And within a few more months, uh, Devane's Twilight Rebirth, which is a 180,000 word book, uh, was finished. And the next book is poised to be even longer. These, these are epic tomes there because there's a, there are uh, eight main characters that are in the, the, the main group of military cadets that go on this adventure that are torn from their homes and thrust into conflict. I take um, the antagonist point of view and I make them relatable as well. You get to know them, you get to know the people on their side that are just gray, that are doing a job, that they're trying to put bread on the table for their families, that they have their own hopes and dreams and aspirations. And even the rulers, even the, the main villains have reasons for their actions. I think that it's important that your villain is as fleshed out as your heroes are. And of course, there are going to be twists along the way about who's related to who, um, what the villain's backstory is, what the hero's backstories are, um, why all these nations have problems with each other, who's right, who's wrong, is there someone who's right or wrong, et cetera. This is so cool. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I could listen to you talk about this all day. I, again, it's it, it seems like the interesting thing for me is is my books in, in terms of writing them have gone through different iterations. So like my first book is not, it's not, not 180,000 words, not <laughs> anywhere remotely close to that. It's, you know, it's this little guy. But the idea behind this book was two things. One, I wrote everything myself. It was, it was this idea of all of, there's all these self-help books out there that have so much fluff in them, mm -hmm. right? All these, like, they're just telling stories, they're rambling on. And I wanted to give people just exactly what it was that they needed to take from this book and to, and to kind of grow with and, and, you know, expand themselves with. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's, it's kind of written that way. My second book is literally just blog posts that I wrote, which like you talked about the habit of writing, which is kind mm -hmm. of what I'm, what I'm leading into. Um, but the third book I actually wrote with a ghost writer. So it's, it's all kind of different perspectives. So I like to talk to, for the people who are watching, I like to talk to the aspiring author, the person who's in that place where they want to write a book, but they never have, and they don't know how, what kind of advice would you give to that person? What would you say to kind of, encourage them to write, to help them out with the writing process, you know, what would your advice be? Uh, well, there's a, a couple different approaches for this. You can take the, um, like they say, with breaking a bad habit, you can go cold turkey. Well, the cold turkey version for getting into writing is to do something like NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month. Um, normally that is in November. Um, they could also be at other points in the year. Uh, but the reason that they do it in November is because NaNoWriMo, so the N-O is the N-O from November. But you sit down, you figure out what kind you want to write about, and then you don't worry about structure or plot. Your goal is just to put words on the page for a month and to worry about parsing through and making it something coherent later. And the goal for NaNoWriMo is normally 50,000 words in a month, which is what people say is the the threshold that you should be reading, if, reaching if you want to be a professional author. If literally all you do is you go to work, you write, and then you do publicity and marketing for yourself, which is a whole different can of worms. <laughs> right. But so that is the cold turkey method. The easier method, I would say, is start and see if you can put 500 words on a page per day. So assume that there's an average of 30 days in a month. You put 500 words on the page. So that is you are producing... Uh, I'm going to get this wrong, 15,000 words a month. So if you put down 15,000 words a month, multiply that by 10 months, so you get to 150,000, then add another 30,000, you are at a Divinity's Twilight 180,000 word book in one year at 500 pages a day. So I am a, a slow author. I average about 700 to 800 words an hour. So if, I, if I'm writing consistently going through, because I do uh, research, I will stop and think about things. Um, I, I, I break a lot of habits that authors say that you should have, that they say you shouldn't bother yourself when you're writing. Well, I try to make sure that I, my first draft is as correct as possible, that all the nitty gritty stuff about the research, about characterization, about mental health, about um, 
combat, about weapons, about tactics, uh, society, et cetera, all that research is correct on the first pass. And then that makes my editing easier, but that's me. Now, my suggestion is just get 500 words down a day. And then it doesn't matter whether they're good, they're bad, whether your sentence structure is right, that can all be parsed through later. The point is forming that habit, 500 words a day. And then be, if, if you're like me, even with doing that research, you can do that 500 words in under an hour. You could probably do it in 45 minutes. So if you have a 45 minute lunch break, you can do your 500 words. If you have 45 minutes away from the kids once they're put to bed, you can do that 500 words. Because you don't just have to think about me being a, a college student when I started writing. I was just taking care of myself. A lot of people have other responsibilities. They have jobs, they have kids, they have uh, communities, they have a lot of people that they are beholden to. And so you have to just figure out when your moments are. And even that, that 45 minutes could be split up among parts of the day. Remember, the goal is 500 words. It's not that the 500 words are gold silk spilling from the mouth of Tolkien. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That, that, mm -hmm. that, that really it makes it into a realistic goal, I think, mm -hmm. at that point. Um, the other thing that I want to emphasize and, and kind of look at is the difference between writing like a, a fantasy novel like, like yourself versus kind of more of like a straight book, if you will. So for instance, I assume that you probably needed like illustrators and, and, you know, different kind of, of team members to kind of come in and, and help you put this together. Was there, was there like anything extra to help like design the cover or the map and things like that? Uh, well, the team, including myself was um, about three people, uh, three or four people. Because there was myself, okay. there was the cover artist, Chris McGrath. Um, he teaches art up in New York. Uh, great artist, uh, actually really famous in uh, fantasy circles. He did Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, uh, which is a 20-book long-running series. Um, it's very similar to Supernatural, if you've ever seen that on TV. Hmm. Uh, but he, he, people love his work. Um, there, He also works for Brandon Sanderson, who, after George R. R. Martin, is probably the most prolific, best-known fantasy author out there. So... Chris McGrath is a big name in covers. I was very delighted, overjoyed that he did my cover, that it's yeah, brought me a lot of great press. And people love the return to like the um, the 90s aesthetic where you have your main characters sitting in front of the fantasy backdrop. Um, in this case, you have the desolate plains in front of uh, Aldona Fortress, which features prominently in the novel. It's where the, uh, the climax of the novel happens. Uh, but... Moving on from that, so Chris McGrath uh, cover art. Terry Johnson did the interior maps. Um, I have my original maps here somewhere, but uh, suffice to say that they were doodles, that um, they looked okay. They, they worked for right. my purposes, that I, I am not an artist. I don't claim to be an artist. Um, I probably should have spent more time doing it because art informs art. It, art influences art that I draw a lot of inspiration from seeing images, from hearing music. That helps me write. And I've heard from artists and from people that create music, that words influence what they do. So there's give and take, they are art flows. Um, but then the, the third member was my editor, Angie Kissling. Um, she works with Morgan James Publishing, uh, contracts out. And so she went through and did final checks, uh, making sure punctuation is correct, making sure dialogue tags are correct, all that little nitty gritty stuff that you do at the end. That's what we call um, either a line or a copy edit. A right. line is typically more involved because you're looking at the flow. Copy edit is just making sure that the, the syntax is appropriate. But so I didn't have uh, many people aside from that, that um, everything else is either my engineering background, the knowledge that I gained from my professors and working in the field, or it's stuff that I researched online, or that I, I've just been a student of history from forever. Um, like you said, Greek or Roman period is my favorite. Um, so mm -hmm. bringing, porting in a lot of that, uh, the especially with regards to the architecture. Um, the Circonian Empire is very much, uh, what if we combined um, the German Reich of World War I with um, the Roman Empire, and they serve as more of the antagonistic force, even if they, they have, um, it, it, I don't want to call them evil because no one in, in any work that I write is supposed to be outright evil. It's more who is at the helm of any institution that makes it good or bad. Mm -hmm. And so the people underneath are just trying to survive, that they're, they're trying, whether they're farmers, whether they're um, work, factory workers, there's a bunch of different stuff because the, um, the time period uh, for Divinity's Twilight is 
what if we had a World War I world that had magic, several systems of magic involved in it, and these magics had caused technology to evolve in a different way than it did in our world. So they have flying battleships and trade vessels along with um, televisions and radio sets at the same time that people are using gunpowder weapons and still wearing chainmail vests and things like that. Because if you have magic, if you have a, a epic cannons and things like that that are enabled with cannons, why do you need to bring up your metallurgy or your um, basically your methods of fighting on the ground that they haven't really evolved past the uh, medieval or Renaissance era in that regard. That's cool. It's, mm -hmm. it's neat how you're kind of blending the, the time periods with it. So mm -hmm. in a, in a story like this, do you ever, do you ever find, find yourself like picking a favorite or, or picking a side with it? Like, like a certain character that you like or, or something like that as, as you're going through. Uh, well, some authors will tell you that their favorite character is the last one that they wrote. Uh, my favorite character is um, Celette, the girl pictured here. And one of the reasons I like her, I mean, this is going to be easier for me because I'm pointing up at the thing. There we go. Celette. <laughs> yeah, everything's and, backwards. And if, you want to see, and if you want to see the image better, you can go to my website, ChristopherRussellAuthor.com. It's right there at the front. It's also on Amazon, all the other different book sale sites. Uh, but she's my favorite because she's different from me in a lot of ways. Um, she has a very keen intellect. She's very um, forthright, brusque. She go, pursues what she wants. She has goals and she aims to reach them. Um, that's part of her weaknesses as well, something that she has to get over. She has to learn to rely on others. That um, She's had a lot of tragedy in her past, and so she doesn't really trust anyone. Um, but So there, there's a lot of cool stuff with doing her segments and getting inside her head. Um, there's also a, a vast difference between what she says, even if she's still being blunt and forthright, and what she thinks. So her thoughts are much more scathing than even what she says, and it's fun to write those thoughts. Yeah, I love getting mm -hmm. to... So a couple of years back, I became a, a really big fan of storytelling and you know, just understanding that like each story has to have a, an arc where there's a setup, a conflict, and a resolution mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And, and so I, I kind of... I guess I took like a shift. I'm a, I'm a big movie goer. I'm a big movie mm -hmm. buff. Me and my girlfriend both are. And um, I kind of shifted to movies that have more of a plot as opposed to movies that, that don't really have much of a plot because I, mm -hmm. I liked seeing the way that stories are told and that they, they unfold and stuff like that. And like, like you're describing here with character development, it's, it's always interesting, especially when there's, there's a lot more going on beneath the surface than just like this kind of surface level character, which just makes it that much more fun. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I, I deal with in this series, uh, this book, um, to a certain degree, that you I have eight pseudo leads. Um, Valen and Celette, pictured here on the cover, the male and the female, are the male and the female protagonists for the series. They are the most important. And then the third is probably Mateo, who is a uh, very important point of view character in this first book. Um, but there are eight people that have to be fleshed out. And so what they start as for characters is sort of stereotypes that you have the you have Valen. He is the egotist that I have the power as the second Triaran. I am the chosen one that I'm going to take on the whole world. No one can stop me. I don't need to train. Yada, da, da. Uh, Celette is the the tactician. She is cunning. She is, like I said, a little bit brash, a little bit imperative but that she tends to be calm and cool and collected unless something from her past pops up and triggers her uh, PTSD, so to speak. Um, you have Mateo, who is the bookworm. He has glasses. He is lanky. He has disheveled, disheveled hair. Um, he is cowardly, that he wants to be like his storybook heroes that he read about while he was um, working for his uh, father's shipping company but that he hasn't been able to reach that level because he something always holds him back, that he freezes up. Um, you have Raynar, who is the original class bully at their uh, military academy, that he is the son of the commandant, and he wields his father's power um, as an extension of himself. So you have all these different people that are stereotypes, and then we start to dig a little deeper. Um, Raynar has hidden deaths. Um, he's one of my favorite characters because he was originally intended to be a throwaway. He was not supposed to go on this adventure. 
and yet he has one of the deepest character arcs throughout the entire series that we're going to go through that it, it's just going to be a lot of fun. That's so cool. It's, mm-hmm. th- I mean, th- this is really just so interesting. Mm-hmm. It's so different for me because I'm, I'm used to talking about, you know, entrepreneurship and personal development. And this is kind of mm-hmm. like, this is like Candyland. This is like fun for me. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Let's talk about Greek mythology and, and fantasy and sci-fi and magic and all this, this mm-hmm. other fun stuff. So when you're not writing, what is Christopher Russell doing? <laughs> uh, well, I so we talked about this before. We both do martial arts. Um, I'm a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. Cool. I've been out of training for a little while. I'm, I got, well, I've been training on my own, but not at a dojo. I went back to a dojo about uh, two or three months ago, started teaching again. And then um, my family had a coronavirus scare. Uh, my grandfather uh, actually sadly passed away from it after they thought he was improving. And then a bunch of oh, the other, uh, my father's right. brothers and sisters, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, a bunch of my father's other brothers and sisters caught it. And so they, it appears that the family is more susceptible than otherwise. And so I took a break from going there for my father's sake. Uh, since I'm currently uh, staying at home and teaching virtually into the uh, University of Virginia. Um, Just coronavirus things. Everybody um, does what they can, does virtual, does these. um, uh, You were doing this podcast beforehand, but I bet that it's been even more meaningful since coronavirus that you're able to reach out and talk to people and get their stories. Well, I actually, I started it in coronavirus. I started it in September. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, I'm bored. (laughs) Like, I was like, I got, I got nothing to do. Why don't I start this show? And I, and I started like, I just started bringing my friends on at first. And my friends are kind of interesting. Don't tell them <laughs> I said that. Um, you know, a lot of them are entrepreneurs or investors and, mm-hmm. and, you know, have cool stories to tell and things like that. And then it expanded and expanded and expanded. And then I'm like, you know what? Let me do author month. And, you know, it's just kind of grown since then. I'm like, wow, this actually worked. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like you said, you know, it's, for me, it's fun because I always I feel like every guest that I bring on here, I feel like I'm just sitting in the living room, you know, having a <laughs> chat with them. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's, it, it's kind of almost the same, which, you know, at first I was like reluctant to like, oh, virtual, you know, why don't I just fly people out? And then I'm like, wait a minute, what am I nuts? Like, <laughs> that's a lot of money the goal yeah. is to make money and have fun, not it, just have fun. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's that's the thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I love what you were saying earlier about how writing is work, but not mm-hmm. really. That's, mm-hmm. that's the epitome of make money and have fun. The, mm-hmm. the thing that I always tell people is I hate the cliche that goes, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Mm-hmm. It's such utter bull crap. Like it doesn't even make sense. What I've done is I've changed it to do what you love and you'll work every single day mm-hmm. of your life, but it won't feel like work anymore. Uh, this and, is what I'll tell people about writing fiction. Yeah. You are going to have a lot of amazing days. You are going to have incredible days where words just flow, where it feels like you're floating down a river and water lilies are passing you on the side and the trees are swaying and the breeze is hitting you and it's just absolutely perfect. The sun is just right, the temperature is amazing. And then you're gonna have days there it feels like you're falling into an abyss, that the darkness is closing over you, that you can't squeeze a single word from your brain and you have to keep writing. Those are the work days. And there's going to be probably at the end, an equal number of those, maybe even more of the work days, because you have to put something to page. You have to keep moving forward. It's all about progress. It's all about momentum. And that's what you're doing when we talked about forming habits, momentum, momentum, momentum. Exactly. Exactly. Chris, this has been awesome, man. How can people get in touch with you? How can they pick up a copy of your book? I know I'm definitely getting one or probably like five because (laughs) this book sounds amazing and I want to pick one up. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, You can go to ChristopherRussellAuthor.com. My name is down here. He's got the link right there. Perfect. Great. Um, That is going to have a lot of information about the series. It's even going to have some free short stories. It's going to have links to From the Shadows, which is free online in ebook format. Um, It's going to have a lot of cool stuff about the world. It's going to have the maps. It's going to have character art. uh, But that's also going to be where you're going to get signed copies of the book from me. Um, You can also get copies of the book anywhere books are sold. You'll find it in Barnes & Noble, Books a Million. Um, You'll find it in uh, Second and Charles, a few of them. Um, I know that's a subsidiary of uh, Books a Million anyway. Uh, You'll find it online. You can find it through BookBub, through Amazon, through BarnesandNoble.com. 
anywhere ebooks are sold, anywhere books are sold. Um, again, the second book is supposed to drop uh, fourth quarter of this year, and I'm also working on getting a standalone, which is going to be an Asian fantasy, so a cool departure from a more European, more Western fantasy and Divinity's Twilight, even if it does have uh, Asian mythology aspects. Um, and that's going to be dropping probably fourth quarter as well, and that's called Descendants of Dusk. It's going to have a cool magic system based on thermodynamics. I'm really excited about it. Um, a cool post-apocalyptic feel in a world that's overrun by ice and frost. Uh, it's going to be great. But so that's what's coming up down the pipe. Um, you know where to find me. Also, Instagram, Christopher underscore Russell underscore author. Uh, Twitter is Chris underscore DT underscore author. Um, and then Facebook, you're going to go to the Divinity's Twilight Fantasy Novels group. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. And this is the office. This is where the printer is. So people uh, come in and out sometimes. That's all good. That's the fun of doing a live show. Mm -hmm. you know, we just we get all kinds of fun stuff that, that happens. I had one show actually cut off the other day. That was pretty hysterical. <laughs> But no, so that's everywhere to find me. Um, had, it was great being on the show with you. I hope everybody checks out the Vase Twilight, that they enjoy it, that they they feed their fantasy brain, that they allow themselves to imagine because that th there's the taking all the moral lessons, all the teachings, all the stuff that uh, you talk about in your books, and this is just adding characters to them. This is mm -hmm. uh, taking those lessons and making them uh, palatable to people that might not pick up a self-help book. Because yeah. every everything you read is going to teach you something, and so this is a way of getting a story from it, from uh, being able to follow people's uh, arcs, their journeys, and being able to connect with them, to take something away from what they're doing and apply it to your own life. Amazing, I love it, Chris. This has been so cool, man. Thanks so much for being on here. Thanks for writing such an awesome book because this sounds like so much fun. I'm definitely going to go geek out on your website after this and find all the cool stuff I can buy. If anybody else wants to grab one of these awesome books, just head over to ChristopherRussellAuthor.com, which is right here. It's also in the description. So I put it in the comments as well, and you can pick up his book there. Chris, what would you like to leave our guests with today? Words of wisdom, advice, encouragement, or just anything you want? Uh, today is the day. Um, pull up a Word document, pull up Scrivener, pull up whatever program you want to write with and get those 500 words down because uh, we made this session a lot about teaching and giving information to an aspiring author. Today is the day that you start that journey. So don't let procrastination, don't let anything stop you. Good luck, go get it. Awesome, I love it. And for those of you that are still with us, we will see you again very, very soon. Have a good one, guys. See you, Fred, thanks. See you.